horse meat. Red hot chili peppers. Grass of death. Oil from Now this Iraq. is entertainment. Jeez. Hey, let's show how far we've come to really show how good Skyrim is. Didn't we already do that with Morrowind? Just do it. Alright. <coughs> Bloody War is an interesting game. I want to compare it to Soul Calibur due to its unique controls, but it's too close to Tekken, but it has more Street Fighter elements than Tekken. Bloody Roar has four buttons, Punch, Kick, Beast, and Rave. Switching into Beast Mode with the Beast button is cool, but it has no risk associated and only really benefits you. As a result, it's a no-brainer to do it when the meter is full. There also isn't much changed about the characters themselves when you transform too, aside from a couple new normals and two new special moves. Rave is a super power-up you can get in beast mode that boosts almost everything about your character, but for a core feature that has its own button, you sure don't get it a lot. Timeouts are super common due to how short and fast the timer is, leading to missed opportunities for comebacks. Despite its problems, it's an overall decent game. I give it a 7.5 out of 10. It seems to me Crash Bandicoot along Final Fantasy VII was the PlayStation game. And ultimately, it shows through. Crash Bandicoot is a very polished game that does what it sets out to do. However, and take this with a grain of salt because I'm not good at Crash, this game teeters on the edge of unfair. Having to do super precise jumps with a D-pad sucks, with Crash feeling super stiff. But, switch over to the joystick and Crash feels super loose and floaty. The 2D sections are also weird as well. Having Crash be able to move in and out of the foreground doesn't do anything, except when you do have to move in and out of the foreground for certain jumps. These jumps, both in 2D and 3D, aren't very well telegraphed either, as depth in this game is a super big problem, which leads to unnecessary deaths. Mario 64 is a fantastic example of how to do this right. Wide open areas that always have the same perspective and forgiving platforming that can still be tricky to master. And while I personally still do have depth problems with that game, it's a lot better than Crash. I give Crash 1 a solid 7 out of 10. Crash Team Racing is Mario Kart 64 on steroids. Blistering speeds, three drift boosts that you have to time instead of just one, items that can do two separate things, fun tracks, and a great soundtrack to boot. Keeping with the tradition of Crash games, this game can be hard as hell, thanks to AI that sometimes rubber bands to catch up on top of the ruthless racing, making every first place rank feel like the achievement it should. 9 out of 10 would definitely recommend. <laughs> One of the first mainstream racing sims, Gran Turismo certainly lives up to its title. However, as someone who casually likes to enjoy racing sims, the cars don't entirely feel like how they should. Now, this isn't inherently a bad thing as Gran Turismo is a more arcadey game, but when you have heavy feeling cars paired with arcade physics, they tend to clash a bit, making for a bit of a rough experience. I give it a 6 out of 10. It's just okay, but the other ones after it are way better. Hear the roar! Spire of the Dragon is considered a classic among many, and for good reason. It's a light-hearted, cheerful game that has the same pickup and play quality as Mario 64, running around and collecting everything in sight. However, this game suffers from a really bad camera that is way too close to Spyro all of the time. The camera also doesn't always follow behind Spyro, meaning if you're running at the camera, the camera won't flip around to behind him. Pair this with having to slowly adjust the camera left or right with the triggers, it makes for some frustrating experiences. However, the core game is just too much fun for the camera to detract from it, despite being a very simple game. I give it an 8 out of 10. You should play it. <laughs> Street Fighter EX2 Plus is one of the best Street Fighter games. Fun core gameplay that plays very similarly to Street Fighter 4, down to having a guard breaking move that costs meter and linkable jabs. Excel is a crazy mechanic that allows even crazier custom combos than Alpha 2 or Alpha 3's Vism, which is super fun to play with. I mean, it has an arcade mode, tries for every single character, a massive roster. I mean, Street Fighter 5 didn't even have some of this, and it came out 17 years after EX2 Plus. I give it a 9 out of 10. It's a fantastic fighting game. The first Guilty Gear is a little rough, but ultimately it's Guilty Gear. Despite fan favorites like Biken, Anji, Testament, and Abba being omitted, and Faust being a weird ball dude, it's surprisingly solid. I give it an 8 out of 10. Good first try, Arxis. I've uh, run out of car sound effects to use. 
R4 is arcade racing at its finest, with beautiful reimaginings of tracks from the original Ridge Racer on top of great original tracks, fantastic looking graphics for the time, fun cars, and entertaining dialogue in a racing game. All of this paired with one of the best soundtracks on the PS1. 9 out of 10, one of the best racing games ever. I don't know what you're expecting, I still don't have any racing sounds. Wipe 3 out, XL has the potential to be great but falls short of the best arcade racers. The vehicles lack any sort of weight both in feel and sound, leaving racing floaty. Combine this with the lack of blistering speeds of the likes of F-Zero X, another arcade racer that is centered around futuristic aircraft, Wipeout XL leaves lackluster feeling. The game also lacks memorable and distinct vehicles. Wipeout instead opts to go with the same vehicle with slight modifications to color palette and shape which again, compared with its contemporaries like F-Zero, causes the game to lack any sort of identity. The soundtrack is also just mediocre. It has some good tracks, but it also has a lot of songs that make me feel like I'm having a seizure. I give it a 6 out of 10. Good ideas, mediocre execution that does not age very well. Resident Evil is commonly credited for creating the survival horror genres we know it today, but the scariest thing about the game are its controls. Having tank controls in a game where you need to run away from enemies to reposition yourself is a bad design choice, and I am dying on this hill. I often hear from fans that it adds tension to the game, but what it really adds is unnecessary frustration as you fiddle to make your character run down a straight hallway, let alone one with multiple turns while zombies follow. This issue wasn't even fixed in the DualShock version of the game, which is a huge missed opportunity to make the game better. The camera only makes this problem worse as perspective flips too often, so now your left is Jill's right because he made one turn down a hallway. Good luck readjusting, dickhead. You also have to use the slow turning tank controls to aim at enemies, where you also can't move while aiming. This is really fun when you have persistent enemies that only move forward. Also, the voice acting, despite me admittedly loving it, is just appalling sometimes. Stop it! Don't open that door! Oh, Barry! That was too close. You were almost a Jill sandwich. <laughs> You're right! Barry, thanks for saving my life! I give it a 5 out of 10. Why is saving locked to a consumable item that when you want to save to exit the game and don't have any items, you're forced to go all the way back to your last save which could have been one and a half hours ago? Why is the lockpick a one-time use item? There are so many questions like these that could have been solved in the director's cut or the DualShock version that just weren't and wouldn't be solved until the GameCube remake six years later. One of the best games of all time, and probably the best sports game ever behind Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3. Despite most PlayStation 1 games from this era feeling somewhat choppy by today's standard, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 still feels smooth, in part to excellent animations, great sound design, and a fantastic soundtrack that almost creates the entire tone for the game. Which is saying something compared to the rest of the PS1 lineup. This is the game that would define Tony Hawk's Pro Skater for the rest of the series, and one of, if not the best, PlayStation 1 game. I give it a 10 out of 10. The pinnacle of the PS1, and Metacritic would definitely agree. Well, Todd, what did we learn today? Why do you expect me to know? I don't know, maybe you have a conclusion to the video? Alright, well, my thoughts are that I'm going to release Skyrim on it. Alright, from a hardware perspective, that's almost impossible. I mean, the PS1 can barely run Kingsfield 2 at 50 frames per second. Second of all, how are you going to fit Skyrim on a PS1 CD-ROM? I mean, you could have multiple discs, but it would ruin the entire pace of the game, let alone be like 36 different discs. Also, how do you plan on making accommodations for the original PS1? Too late, it's done. To be honest, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> Now that you're feeling real tipsy.